Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Parkview. We are so thrilled that you are here with us. And as always, we have some announcements, so please listen up. We are so very excited that our discipleship groups are meeting again tonight. If you are already a part of one of these groups, this is one of the best ways to get involved. There is a list of all the leaders in your worship guide that you can get in touch with. These groups are all about encouragement, discipleship, and restoring brokenness. If you would like more information on these groups, Pastor Mike would love to talk to you. Our next First Wednesday service is coming up on April 6th at 6 p.m. This is the night where we bring the entire church together to worship, read God's word, and pray together. Each month, we look forward to this time to have together as a church. We're so excited to see all of you there. For everyone who loves a little competition, we have rescheduled our Friday fellowship for April 8th at 6.30 p.m. This is an awesome time to come together, have fun, play games, eat food, and more. It is open to the entire church and the community, so we encourage you to invite as many friends as you can. We really hope to see you all there. If this is anyone's first time here, we are honored that you are here with us. We would love for you to take time to fill out one of these Connect cards, which you can find in the pew in front of you. These cards can also be used to let us know about your prayer requests or any info that you would like to share with us about yourself. Once you fill it out, you can drop it in one of our offering stands. These are located at the front door entrance, the side door next to the stage, and out in the lobby. If you have any questions about what is coming up at Parkview, you can check out the worship guide. And of course, if you would like to get updates via text, you can sign up for our Remind text by calling the church office any time during the week. As always, we're so very glad that you are here with us this morning, and we hope that you enjoy the service. Yay! All right. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to begin our time of worship this morning, as we always do with a reading from God's Word, and then Stephen and the team will lead us in some worship before we come back and, and share more from the Word of God. Proverbs chapter 4 is an amazing chapter. I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm going to read a lot of it. And we're going to begin in verse number 1. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. When I was a boy in my father's house, still tender and an only child of my mother, he taught me and said, Lay hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or swerve from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Esteem her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will set a garland of grace on your head and present you with a crown of splendor. Listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. I guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. Verse number 20. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wisdom that you have made available to us in your word through the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, as Solomon did in the book of Proverbs, Lord, today we cry out for wisdom. Lord, would you speak to us today? 
Father, would you have your way with our hearts and our minds? Lord, would we, at this moment, yield ourselves and surrender to you in full submission? As we offer up our worship to you, Lord, I pray that our hearts will be pure before you, that it will be worship that will be pleasing in your sight, and a fresh sound to your ears, Lord, and an aroma to you that is a fragrance, that is an offering worthy of our love. Lord, I pray that you'll build a hedge of protection around this place, Lord, that your Holy Spirit again would have the freedom to rule and to reign our hearts and everything said and done in, in this room as we sing and as we listen to your word. Lord, I, my prayer is simply this, that in all ways that we would give ourselves to you and allow you to have your way with us in the way that you want to as a church, as families, and as individuals. Lord, we give this day to you and we thank you for loving us through your son, Jesus Christ. And through his atoning sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, Lord, that's the only reason we can come and worship you today. And that's the only way we can be saved. And so we thank you again in his name. Amen.
Cause I know you'll make a way I don't always understand I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will believe it You make mountains move You make giants fall And you use songs of praise To shake prison walls I will speak to my fear I will preach to my doubt That you were faithful then You'll be faithful now Sing it out, I am standing I am standing on your word I'm calling heaven
brokenness and weakness Lord we don't need to strive through our own strength but we can come to you because you are the way maker if we're walking where you're leading us Lord we don't have to worry even in times where we don't seem to feel it or see it or know what's going on Lord I pray you would give us the confidence to have that faith and trust in you to follow in your steps, Lord, where you're leading, because that is a place of peace. That is a place of fulfillment in you. We can't have fulfillment in anything but you, Lord. I just pray that you would help us where we lack our faith, Lord. You would help us in that, to walk in your way, because you are the way, Lord. And we thank you and we praise your name for that this morning. Because you are way he made you. Miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. speak to our hearts because we're longing to hear from you that's what we need pray we would lay down anything we might have brought in that's distracting us Lord and focus on you lay it at your feet and follow the one who is the way and the truth and the life Lord pray that we would be obedient to you this morning in your son's name we pray amen Thank you to our praise team. I will say this, the future of the church, I think, is bright with a young generation. I have a distinct advantage over you all from week to week. And that is, you don't know what I'm going to preach right now, and I've been working on it for days. And so it's marinated within me for quite some time. I've dealt with all of these things that uh, I have prepared for you this morning, and much more that got left behind. Because if I had I brought it all, uh, you wouldn't have made it. I wouldn't have made it either. I have another distinct advantage over you, and that is, as I know what is prepared for you from our praise team perspective, I create my playlists in my phone for what's coming on Sunday, and I worship all week long, and I love every minute of it. Again, I have a distinct advantage over you because I get here early on Sunday mornings as they get here early, and I'm about to give, give away one of my hiding places. If you ever can't find me, you, you'll know at least one place to look. And that is while our praise team is working in the early time on Sunday morning, I walk into the baptistry and sit on the steps. And I listen in there so that nobody will find me until now I've given away my hiding place. <laughs> and I continue to worship, looking forward to this moment on Sunday mornings. And I'll say to you this, you have been prayed for all week long. I know that, because I know who your prayer partners are, and I know how they pray, and I know how I've prayed for you as well, and you were prayed for all the way up to the beginning of Sunday school this morning as well, and I just want to encourage you with that, because I believe we're not here by accident. I don't know why you came today. 
I don't know what you're hoping for or expecting today to go home with or whatever, but I do believe God has a word for you this morning. This year, as 2022 rolled around, we began with a series of messages that was entitled, What Moves the Heart of God? And if you remember anything of those messages that we began in January, we began to talk about the fact that of all things that move the heart of God, faith is probably the number one thing that moves the heart of God. The scripture tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 that without faith it is impossible to please God. Jesus was amazed at faith as he watched it on earth when he was here. He was also amazed at people's unbelief which is the opposite of faith when they just did not believe in him. And it amazed him in both cases. As we went through that series of messages, we finalized that series with a message that brought us to Matthew chapter 6 that brought us some words of warning, if you remember. And the words of warning came from Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, where he said, Be very careful then how you do your acts of righteousness before men. He told us we have to be very careful because as we begin to follow God in faith, as we seek to obey God and honor God with lives of faith and we grow closer to God, what the, the tendency could lead to is that then we could be puffed up and possibly proud of who we are in our acts of righteousness. So Jesus says you need to be very careful then how you do these things so that your motivation is pure and that your heart is as right as it can be. And he gave us three examples and we talked about those. He told us you're not to give in this way, but then he teaches us how we are to give. He said you are not to fast in this way, he said, but this is how you are to fast. And then he said to us, you are not to pray like this. But then he said, this then is how you should pray. And that's where we've been since then. Because then he taught us how to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, he said, our daily bread. And then last week we talked about forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus said, this then is how you should pray. Our Father, oh, our dearest, loving, heavenly Father, you are sovereign, you are King of kings, you are Lord of lords, there is no one beside you, there is no other God before you, there is no other God, you are God over all creation, and you, Father, have invited us into a loving relationship with you where we have been given access to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we can address you as our dearest Father, Daddy. Oh, what a joy to know that God has invited anyone into a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ that we then can address the God of all creation, the sovereign King of kings, as our dearest heavenly Father. Oh, if that... I prayed this morning as I listened to the prayers of others in this circle before Sunday school... And I said again, Lord, may we never get over these facts. May we never grow so ho-hum about these kinds of facts and these truths that just are mind-boggling to me that we can talk to God. He invites that. He enjoys this. And then he says, begin with these words, Hallowed be thy name. 
God, my desire is to hallow your name, to lift high the name of Jesus, to exalt your name above every other name, to make it known, to glorify it, to make it known as being holy. God, it is my desire that that your name be hallowed through my life, through who I am, the things I say, the things I do, my actions, everything about me, Lord, may I hallow your name. May people see and know the name of Jesus Christ through me. And then he says, thy kingdom come. God, I invite your kingdom rule over my heart, Lord, over my mind, over everything about me. Lord, your kingdom rule is not anything about a border or or some kind of territory. It is about your rule in my heart. Lord, may my life be given to your rule over everything in me. In fact, God, your will be done in my life on earth as it is in heaven lord your will in heaven is done instantly instantaneously there's no hesitation it is done with great joy it is done with great happiness and and again just like that lord that's how i want your will to be done in my life as if i were in heaven right now i want it done on earth and then jesus pivots the prayer as we have said, God, I want to hallow your name. I want your kingdom to rule and I want your will to be done. And he allows us to focus on ourselves for a moment. He says, give us this day our daily bread. It's a humble reminder that even though the psalmist in Psalm 139 says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, intricately woven together in our mother's womb by God, that our lives are still very fragile. And Lord, I need daily provision and only you can give it to me. And so, God, I trust you for every daily need I ever have. And then, as I said last week, we we talked about this massive subject of forgiveness. Lord, will you forgive me a debt that is so astronomical that I cannot pay? Lord, would you forgive this debt that I have as I then seek to also forgive the minute debts that others may owe me in comparison to what I owe you? Oh, that's big. And then we come to this final phrase in the prayer. Before we next week move into the Easter season, which we're now in. And Jesus uses these words again, prayed in the context of community and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The title of my message this morning is this, Pray I Do This Well. Now I'm going to give you some context on that just because I can. I don't preach messages in honor of people, but I have a story to tell you. A little over a year ago, January of 2021, I was carrying on a text conversation, I think I've told this story, with Donna Sue Swain. And most of you in this room know Donna Sue, you remember her better than I do even, by far. And she texted me that Sunday afternoon, January 24th, I think it was January 24th, I'm pretty certain of that, I forgot my phone. And she bragged on me and my preaching that day. She doesn't get out much. She doesn't hear much good preaching, so she thought I was the best preacher there was. Anyway, she was so encouraging. And we went back and forth. I have saved this text on my phone all this time. And then she said this on that Sunday afternoon. She said, by the way, Mike, tomorrow I start hospice. And the next line in her text said this, pray I do this well. And I was like, wow, that's what this subject is about today. Pray that I do this well. Wednesday night, I shared a little bit of kind of a snapshot into this morning with our Wednesday night group. And I began by telling them that this part of the Lord's Prayer is indeed a prayer of humility. I shared several things here at the beginning of what I'm going to share with you now with them, and that is that this prayer of humility grows out of this distrust that I have in myself. Why? Because I know me. I know Mike pretty good. I may not know every dark, deep recess of my heart the way God knows it, because I can't understand my own heart, but I know me pretty good, and I want to publicly acknowledge my deficiency in handling all the things of life. Because the tests that are used by God to strengthen me, the tests that are used by God to grow me, oftentimes are failed by me and it can lead to a temptation to sin. I again publicly declare to you that I am afraid of my own weaknesses. 
I am afraid and aware of my own inabilities. I am a man. I am afraid of the shallowness of my devotion. I am afraid of my weakness, of my love that I declare to God. I know that my flesh is weak. I live also not only in in a weak flesh, but also in a fallen world which around me presents an ever-present threat to my virtue because of the world in which we live. Simply put, I am a sinful man and the world around me envelops me with a culture that is ruled by pride, a culture that is ruled by logic that's based on the lusts that have have twisted it, and we live in this, this realm of human opinion that is a deception that wants to suck us into it, filling us with envy, filling us with hatred, filling us with greed, and all kinds of misplaced affections. Evil tendencies abound, and they dominate all of us and all around us. I'm like Miss Donna Sue. I want to do things right. I want to do this well. But so often it feels like that I yield to the unceasing and the unrelenting pull and this force of the world and my sinful nature against me. I want to do things well. I don't always accomplish that. God has put us in this world... For his glory, yet the world is dangerous. And it's dangerous, we are weak. I would say to you this do not kid yourself. Because without divine protection, you're in serious trouble. Without a knowledge that apart from the guidance and the deliverance of a, of, of a holy God in your life, you will not make it. I don't care how good you think you are. I don't care how holy you might pretend to be. On your own, you will fail. And these words of Miss Donna Sue just still ring in me today. Pray, Mike, that I do this well. God is our only hope at times. God is our only refuge. He is our only fortress. He is our only protection that we can hold on to. Which which turns into this prayer, Lord, do not let me get into a situation that will devastate me. Do not let me get into a situation that will ruin me. Lord, you are my rock. You are my shelter. You are my hiding place. Is what the prayer is. You are my covering. And I ask you, Lord, to protect me, and I ask you for my deliverance. Now, let me give you three quick definitions before we try to answer these three questions that are before us today. The first definition would be this word lead, where he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's a very simple word. It means to guide. Lord, would you lead me through life? Would you guide my steps? Would you guide my thoughts? Would you guide my actions and everything I do? So it's a guidance term. Lead me, Lord, in this way. The second definition I want to give you is the word deliver. And it's an interesting word in the original Greek language that can literally describe a snatching away, to snatch out. So let me kind of help paint a picture for you for just a moment. As we pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation. Guide us, Father, in everything we do and deliver us from the evil one. Lord, if I get a little too close, if I begin to mess up, if I begin to get in my flesh, Lord, would you snatch me out of the clutches of the evil one? Lord, would you protect me when I was maybe trying to protect myself and trying to do right, and because I'm who I, I, I am who I am, I, I, I lost my way. Lord, would you snatch me out? in that way. A wonderful word picture. And then this word temptation is a word that we must define today because this word has a dual meaning. It has two very distinct meanings in the original Greek text, okay? And so uh, there's, there's two sides to this one coin, if you will. The first definition of this word temptation is sin, okay? It is the sin that we can fall into, The second definition of this word is a test or a trial in order to prove the genuineness of one's faith. The word can mean both things. So, 
Those definitions are important to us so that we can consider. I, there's two very distinct prayers, okay? Lord, okay, I don't want to be tempted to sin. Lord, this test and this trial is kind of tough right now, and, and I'm still tempted to, to yield to things that will result in sin. But Lord, either way, I don't want to give in, whether it's sin, the temptation of sin, or the temptation to, to quit under the tests and the trials of life that are used by God to prove my faith. So let's try to answer three questions this morning as we, as we think about praying this prayer the way we should, the way Jesus intended for us. And the first question is this, what do I need to know about life's trials? What do I need to know about life's trials? Well, let's address these first two things that I just mentioned. The first one is this. We have an enemy who wants to destroy us. You have an enemy today, you must know this, who has a much greater purpose than just to make you do bad things, to make you think wrong thoughts, to make you say things that are not God-honoring. You have an enemy today that seeks your destruction, period. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus put it like this. He called him the thief. He said, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Satan, your adversary, is a thief that comes to steal anything he can from you in life, to kill whatever he can in your life, and to destroy you, period, end of story. Peter puts it like this in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 where he says, The enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may what? Devour. He wants to steal. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. He wants to devour you. You are not up to the task on your own. You cannot do it yourself. If you have your Bibles and you want to look, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said to this church. He said to them, beginning in verse 1, I feel like this, verse 1. He says, I hope you'll put up with a little of my foolishness, but you're already doing that, is what Paul says. He says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. Then listen to what he says in verse 3. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Paul understood the reality of things for this church. And this reality still exists for us today. And that is just as Eve was deceived by what? By the serpent's cunning. He can lead us astray even though we began with a pure and sincere devotion to Christ. Do you understand what I'm telling you when I say to you today, you have an adversary today. He is called the accuser of the brethren. He is called a thief. He is called a roaring lion the Bible says he disguises himself as an angel of light. He works through people. He works through all kinds of ways. Why? Because he seeks your destruction. And you must know that. And apart from a humble realization in prayer to a holy God, God, if you are not my leader, if you are not my guide, Lord, if you don't even take over where I'm about to really mess it up and snatch me out, Lord, I don't stand a chance. I need your help today. No one in this room can stand and say, I'm above sin or above the serpent's cunning and his deception. Now, the second thing you need to know about life's trials is this other side of the coin. And that is, on the God side of the coin where he tests us, he allows us to go through trials to prove the genuineness of our faith. We will all face challenges that test us. Can I get a witness? Some of you have gone through challenges that I am, quite honestly, very grateful that I have not had to do. Because I don't know that I would have withstood the test. And you can think about others in this room, you can think about your own life and you can go back and see, Lori and I have been through tests. We have been through trials. 
The Lord has done so to prove the genuineness of our faith. He will do it for everyone. Does that make you happy today? <laughs> I don't know of anybody that prays for suffering. I don't know of anybody who prays for hardships and hard times. But Jesus in John chapter 16 and verse 33 says, In this world you will have trouble. And then he says, But take heart, I have overcome the world. Notice a couple other places what uh, the Bible tells us about God's purpose in our testings and in our trials. James chapter 1, listen to a couple of these verses. Beginning in verse number 2, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance, he says, must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The testings in your life that come that you need to pray, Lord, help me in these things, are so that you are grown up in maturity so that you lack nothing. Uh, if you're in James, just turn to your right. Go to 1 Peter, if you will, chapter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. And beginning in verse number 12, this is what we read. Peter says to us in verses 12 through 14, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you were suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. In other words, sufferings are not strange. They're not unusual to God. All right? But he says, But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. Now again, just to remind you that, that you are not the only one that have gone through these things. Jesus went through them Himself. There's an interesting word used about Jesus in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8 that still kind of, I, I don't fully understand. But uh, you'll, you'll hear it here in just a second. In verse number 8 of Hebrews chapter 5, we read this. Speaking of Jesus, although He was a son, He learned obedience from what He suffered. The Son of God learned obedience. I don't really quite know how to deal with that yet, still. After all these years, looking at that verse, going, you know, the Son of God learned obedience through suffering? And then we, if we're crying in our suffering, God, why are you teaching me this? Why am I have to go through this? Well, apparently I need to learn some obedience. Apparently there's something that God is still maturing Mike with and he's maturing me in so that, why? I can attain the fullness of maturity in Christ. Hello, Ephesians 4.13. That is God's goal for our life so that we become mature, fully attaining to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if you're still in Hebrews, uh, it goes on and says it more in Hebrews chapter 12. We're told that since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses to throw off everything that hinders us, and the sin that so easily entangles, and then to run the race with perseverance, the race marked out for us. And then he says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, we are told who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I'm here to bless you today. God has ordained suffering. God has ordained trials. And these tests, why? So that we can attain to the fullness, the, 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 the maturity that God has called us to, to be like His Son Jesus. And if we want to celebrate in His resurrection, we must glory also in His sufferings and thank the Lord when He is doing that work in our lives that He is maturing Mike, He is maturing me. So what do we need to learn from trials today? Number one, we have an enemy who wants to destroy us. But number two, we have a God who wants to develop us. We have a God who wants to do for us what we would not do on our own, but because He loves us so much, He will ordain such things. The third thing we need to learn from the uh, trials of life is this. The real enemy is evil, not suffering. Your enemy is not suffering. 
As bad as suffering is, as, as, as much as I don't like it, as much as I know you don't like it, as much as we want to avoid it at all cost, that's not our problem. The enemy is not that. The enemy is the evil that God, uh, excuse me, that Satan would want us to, uh, to yield to. In 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 6 and 7, it says this, again, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come, Peter goes on to say, so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Oftentimes, God's tool to develop us is suffering. Suffering refines us. Sin is what destroys us. It's not the evil that we need to, uh, it's not the suffering that we need to worry about, it's the evil that we need to be on the lookout for. One writer, as he was writing about this, as I was reading some of his things about it, he said, it's really the difference in the two kind of views that people have for Christianity. He said, in America today, we have a, many people have a vacation view of Christianity. Woohoo, I'm a, I'm a Christ follower now, everything's going to be simple and easy and a bed of roses. Are you kidding me? He said it's a difference in that vacation view and a war view. You have entered into the war more than ever before. The war that Satan still wages every day for the souls of man and for, again, your destruction. And your prayer, your reliance, your dependence on a holy God is your only hope. That's what we need to know about life's trials. Number two, how does God deliver me through these trials? Let's get very practical and very simple. How does He deliver us? Number one, by trusting Him. By believing in God. By exercising our faith in the only one who can protect us. Uh, you know, again, uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. He says to us, Mike, trust in me with all your heart. He does not say trust in me when you cannot figure out the way. He does not say when your intelligence runs out, which is pretty quick, then trust in me. He says, trust in me with all your heart at all times. Lean not, Mike, on your own understanding. Your own understanding will lead you astray. Mine will not, God says. And in all your ways, Mike, acknowledge him in all your ways. The only way to begin to discern and understand and work through all of life's trials is to place your trust fully in Him. I've used the illustration before. I think the best, in, in my mind, one of the best illustrations to give it is when you say, well, how do I trust in God with all my heart? It's like that pond that has that ice on it. And I mean, when I was up in Ohio and we were playing golf, when the, when the a spring thaw came, the lakes were still frozen over. And I watched grown men go out on the lake, go after their ball because they couldn't hit it in the fairway. I thought, that's your first problem. Second problem is, you're walking on that ice now, and I ain't going out there after your ball. You can do it if you want to. I'm not going. But that's what trusting in God is all about. When you say, okay, God, I'm putting my, the full weight of everything I am in your hands because I know you're not going to let me down. I know you will not let me fall. That is what it means to trust God. When you, when you shed every other belief, every other faith, every other option that you can believe in and say, God, you are it, that's when salvation comes. That's when you are a child of the King. And that's when you know you are in the good hands of a loving Heavenly Father. Trust in Him. Number two, we have to submit to Him. And surrender our lives to Him. This, again, is what it says in Proverbs 3, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Again, I love what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 23, as he talks about the example that Jesus gave us to follow, and he says how Jesus entrusted Himself to the one who judges justly. We must entrust ourselves to Him. If you think you can come to God today and still hold some of the cards and still have some, of, some authority 
in his say over your life, I don't know where you've got that from. It's not, certainly not in the Bible. It's certainly not anything I've ever taught. It's not anything that God would have ever had you learn. It is just your flesh that continues to want to hold on to certain things when he has said, you have to submit everything to me. And as you surrender all of your life to me, then, then I'll begin to show you the way. The third thing I would tell you to deliver you through trials is simply this, knowing God's Word. Knowing God's Word. I've said before, and it hadn't been too long ago, and this is just going to challenge you. Are you all okay with being challenged every so often? Is that okay for me to do? You know as much of God's Word as you want to. That's just the truth. I mean... People who go home all the time say, well, that preacher, he just didn't feed me. Are you kidding? It ain't my fault. It's no other pastor's fault. It's not your Sunday school teacher's fault. It's not your day leader's fault. You know as much of the Bible as you want to know. And, and when, <laughs> we just know as much of God's Word as we want. Psalm 119 and verse 18 the psalmist says, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. I'm convinced the reason why we don't know the Word of God is we, think, we don't think it's that wonderful. And the psalmist says, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Wonderful things await you in the Word of God. To fill you with a faith, to fill you with a courage, to fill you with a boldness in the midst of all these difficult trials and troubles that we have to endure. Oh, you say, my Mike, how, how, how can I be delivered through these things? Well, do you trust God fully? Have you surrendered everything to Him? Do you know His Word? Do you rest in His Word? Jesus in John 15 said, if you abide in me and I abide in you, then, then these things, it'll, it'll work out. You will bear fruit. He says, but if you do not abide in me, you can do nothing. How can you abide in God and not abide in His Word? You cannot do those things. Separate. They are one and the same. How does He deliver me through trials? Through an unwavering trust, an unqualifying surrender to Him, and an unyielding approach to the Word of God as being God's holy Word to me. But listen to number four, and this one's key to me today. And I'm going to give you a little bit of my philosophy all right, I know I'm not supposed to give philosophy, I'm supposed to preach, but I'm going to give you a little bit of what I think the Lord wants to hear today. Number four, how do I get delivered to this? By being in community with other believers. By being in community with other believers. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, we're told a couple of things. To not give up meeting together. Why? So that we can spur one another on to good deeds and encourage one another as the day is approaching. Spur one another on to good deeds and encourage one another. You cannot do that in a vacuum. You cannot do that by yourself. You need one another to spur one another on to good deeds and to encourage one another. But then in James chapter 5 and verse 16, we're also told this, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now here's my philosophy. I'll let you deal with it the way you want to. If anybody looked at me today and said, Mike, I can only give you one. I can't give you both. I can either be with you in church on Sunday morning, Mike, or in a discipleship group on Sunday night. Which one should I go to? I would unequivocally tell you, go to a group on Sunday night and skip Sunday morning. That's my philosophy. Now you may not agree with me, and that's quite all right. We don't have to agree on that. But here's what I know. It is so easy to be lost and be in obscurity in a large group. When you get yourself in a small group, guess what begins to happen? Immediately, friendships and bonds begin to take place at a greater level. Why? Because you're in a smaller group. Why? Because then you're going to be able to grow in your knowledge of one another. You're going to be able to share deeper with one another. You're going to be able to share and confess sins with one another, pray for one another, encourage one another at a much deeper level. There is no better picture of the church than when it meets in the home. There's no better picture. That's where it started in the book of Acts. 
And there's no better opportunity for you to grow deeper in not only in knowledge, but in fellowship and in community and in prayer and in lifting one another up and and strengthening each other in holiness and godliness than in that group like that. And I am not forecasting and I'm not a prophet. But look out, America, as the church may be having to go underground one day. Just look out. Then what are you going to do? If this is all you've ever had right here. Now listen, we're, we're to be here in corporate worship. Don't get me wrong. Don't go out and misquote me. But if you had to only pick one, that's where I would send you today. If you need to know your options for a D group tonight, let me know after church. I can help you. What are the goals of the trials of life is the last question. Obviously, number one, the first one, we've already answered it. And that is to be like Christ. The goal of these kinds of things in life is to be like Him. Trials are not unusual for God. They are used by God for our benefit. And I would say to you this, that it is your calling to such things. It is the way of the kingdom of God. Number two, it produces humility. A characteristic that is used by God and necessary to be used by Him. These kinds of trials that produce this kind of humility will take care of a lot of the arrogance that exists in a lot of people. God will not use arrogance. It is far too ugly, and it assumes far more on the person than it does, than it gives to God. Our goal is to be like Christ. It is to produce humility. Number three, it is to cultivate endurance. This is what the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews chapter 12. We are to run with endurance the race that is marked out for us. The only way you can run with endurance is to continue to run a little bit at a time, then more, and continue to run a little bit more, and continue to run a little bit more. And so guess what? If one trial is over with and you have a little rest, look out, another one will come because God is continuing to want to create and cultivate your endurance. The Christian life is not for the faint of heart. There are a lot of people who have said the Christian life is very difficult to live. I say to them, no, you're wrong. The Christian life is impossible to live. It's impossible to live. You must rely on the gift, the presence, and the power of the Holy Spirit in you for you to have any chance to live the Christian life. It's impossible. None of us can do this. Your pastor cannot do it. You cannot do it apart from this kind of trust and reliance and surrender on the Holy Spirit of God. And then this final word I give you today, which to me takes it back full circle. When I think about what are the goals of the the trials of life, it is this. It develops, they develop a deep, abiding love and trust in my dearest Father. Our Father, who art in heaven. And as these trials develop that trust in that dearest Father that I know has me, I go back to the beginning again and I begin to pray even more once again. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh Lord, I've already trusted you to give me this daily bread and you have every day. You've never failed me. And Lord, as as you do that, I thank you for it. And Lord, forgive me this astronomical debt that I have of sin. As I forgive others these little minute debts that they have committed against me. Lord, they're nothing compared to what I owe you. And thank you, Lord, and I ask you one more time to lead me, not into temptation, but to deliver me from the evil one. Pray I do this well. Wow, what a confession. Miss Donna Sue knew she was on the last leg of her final test. And that godly woman had enough of the Spirit of God in her at that moment to say, pray, pray I do this well. Man. That is humbling. And honestly, it's downright humiliating to know where I am compared to that. But I want to do things well. We can't do that on our own. Let's pray.
Father, I thank you today for the fact that we don't have to do this alone. Jesus, you've given us a prayer that has said, <laughs> pray this way. And if we would only pray in that way, oh Lord, then you'd begin to reveal so much more of yourself to us. You'd begin to show us things that, that will amaze us even more of the love that you have for us, your care, your goodness, your grace, your mercy. Father, I thank you for the fact that we can call you dearest Father, that we can speak to you with the most endearing terms that you have allowed us to. And Lord, I, I am quite positive that it makes your heart leap when we come to you in that way. Father, I pray that you'll bless your church today because I don't even know, as I stand here, knowing who all is in front of me right now, knowing whoever may be on live stream at this moment, Lord, I have no idea of the tests that are going on right now in every life. I have no idea what the trials may be. As you individually are working your, your plan in, in all of us, in all of our different homes, and, and in our church as a whole, yes. But Father, in, in a way to prove the genuineness of our faith. And Lord, in the midst of that, I know it hurts. I have hurt, Lord. I know what suffering is. Lord, I thank you that I don't know it like some have. But Lord, your, your goals... For us to be like your son, Jesus Christ, that's enough. That's enough right there. I want to be like him. Lord, where, where I have failed you, Lord, I pray you'll forgive me. I pray, Lord, that you'll test me yet again. Give me another opportunity. Improving the genuineness of my faith. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to do this for your church. And that we'll be found faithful. But Lord, we need your help. Lord, as you allow certain trials, testings, all these things to come, Father, if we don't fully rely upon you, we'll fail again. And then we've lost the battle another time. Lord, would you help us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand? As you stand and get ready to, to sing, to pray, to make a, a decision for Christ, I don't know what you need to do today. Stephen and Melody are going to lead us in this song. I invite you to use the altar if you need to. The altar is open for you. If you need a prayer partner, grab somebody. Let them pray with you and pray over you, whatever you might need. If you need to say today, Lord, Mike, you know, I need to give the Lord my life. I have not been saved. I have not been born again. And today I want to put the full weight of my trust upon the work of Jesus Christ on Calvary for the forgiveness of my sin, and I want to become a child of the King today. Would you come and let me know that? Would you come and say, Mike, this is the decision I have, have come to based on the, the drawing of the Holy Spirit in my life to give my life to Jesus Christ today. And today can be the day of salvation, which is what it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Now is the acceptable time. Today is that day. You don't have to go home and do anything. You don't have to go home and get things cleaned up first. That's the Holy Spirit's job. He'll take care of all those things later. Okay? But today you can confess Christ and be born again today. If you want to join our church, I will welcome you as a fellow believer in the Lord. Whatever the decision you need to make, I invite you to do that today as we sing under their leadership. You come.
Stay up here, brother. I'm going to step up. <laughs> I'm either too... I'm going to tell you about a new friend I just made. His name is Joe. You want me to tell you everything I know about Joe? That's what I know. <laughs> Joe came to me and said, Mike, I need to be saved. <laughs> I, you know... And this, I can't remember everything I just said to Joe, but I said, you know what? When you're born again by asking Christ to save you from your sin, you are free from the penalty of sin. I also said you are free from the guilt that comes from sin. No more penalty, no more guilt, no more shame, gone. Because when Jesus saves you from your sin and you are washed by the blood of the Lamb and your sin are, is gone, placed as far as the east is from the west, never to be brought up again, here is a free man today named Joe. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, awesome. I don't know what else to say. That's just how good God is. And Joe might like to know your name too. You come and introduce yourself to Joe. And you tell him something that you mean. If you, will. If, if you don't mean it, don't say it. Joe, I'm going to be praying for you. I want to pray for you as you begin your life with God in Jesus Christ as a new creature, as a new Christian. And if you mean it, you come tell him. And you, then you follow through and you pray for him. All right? I hope you'll go to a D group tonight. I get to lead one tonight. I can't wait. I don't get to do that too often, but I am tonight. But uh, anyway, Miss Kathy, I feel, still think, has a, we forgot to put her in the, the video, but a 40-day prayer initiative. If you want to talk about praying for 40 days, you talk to Miss Kathy uh, on your way out. Let's pray as we go today and just rejoice and thank God for who He is. Lord, I thank you today for the fact that you still save sinners like me, like Mike, or that you would save me from my sin still amazes me. And that, Lord, I can live guilt-free myself, free of the penalty, free of ever having to hear about my sin again, Lord, because that's what you have decided to do. You will never bring it up again. You've cast it out because you've made me born again into your family. Lord, I thank you for the fact that you've done that for Joe today through a very simple confession of the heart and belief that you are the only salvation for us today. Thank you for the, re, uh, the redemption found in the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Lord, help us to do things well. Pray, Lord, we pray today that we can live life well, like Miss Donna Sue said. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.